Hey there, Fletcher Things Overlanding here, and today I'm going to be talking about the basics of solar power. A lot of the times I feel like I see people posting in Facebook groups, including my newbie Overlanders group, which if you're not a member of, there's a link in the description down below. You should go check it out. But in that group specifically, I've seen a lot of people post saying, I'm a little intimidated by solar. What do I need? You know, how much is involved? Can I just hook it straight up to my battery? That kind of thing. So while I'm not an electrician, I still wanted to give you guys some of the basics and the things I've learned and remove some of the mystery around solar. So again, if you want to learn some basics and get a good idea of whether solar is right for you in your overlanding or camping setup, this should be a good video slash podcast for you. So if you want to learn more about that, stay tuned. Let you go. Ooh, let's just pull you closer. Ooh, I can't understand where it came from, but you got it, my God, it, it began in the land of the sandstorm. I fought it, though I wanted it. All right, so as I mentioned in the intro today, I'm talking about the basics of solar power, why it's not so intimidating, why you shouldn't be scared of it, why it's a really great option for so many things from charging your starter battery and keeping it topped off to powering a dual battery setup or recharging like a portable power bank. So again, I'm going to touch on a few topics in this episode of the podcast. I'm going to run you through these things and give you kind of my feedback, the things that I've learned on these, hopefully shortcut a lot of the learning curve on solar and again, make you more confident in your ability to understand it and make a decision on whether it's right for you. I'm going to start by talking about why it's not so scary and just kind of the basics of how it works. Then I'm gonna move on to the different sort of types of solar panels and kind of give you just a really brief understanding of what those are and uh, what the differences are and which one might be right for you. And then I'm gonna kind of finish up with uses, right? How can you use solar power? What are some good uses of solar power for overlanding, for camping, for different sort of applications like that? So if you are thinking about it and you're sort of curious about solar power, this should be a good primer for you. So let's start out by diving into why it's not so scary, just kind of the basics of what you will need in order to run solar power on your overlanding or camping setup. So when I say it's not so scary, what I mean by that is that solar power is actually a really simple, really straightforward way to get power to recharge things or to run existing things. So think of it this way, you've got a solar panel, right? And that solar panel is gonna collect energy from the sun and it's gonna transfer it via cables, just like DC power, a red and a black, a positive and a negative, into some sort of a controller. And then that controller is gonna say how much power is coming in, it's gonna shunt it out to your power collector, AKA your battery. And that's basically how solar works. So again, it's to me, it's a lot like just regular old 12 volt DC power. It is a positive and a negative coming from a source of solar power collection going through a controller or something that will control how much power is actually coming from the sun and then moving it over safely into some sort of a storage container like a LifePo4 battery, an AGM battery, or your starter battery. Maybe like more like your traditional lead acid batteries. So one of the main sort of questions that I hear a lot is, hey, I got this solar panel. Can I just connect my positive and negative to my battery? And the answer to that is not really. Um, there needs to be something that is smart enough in between that solar panel and the battery to control how that power is shunted in and to prevent overcharging or things like that. Uh, keep in mind that like solar panels are pretty greatly impacted by weather, by coverage. If you are under a bunch of shade, you're gonna get far less effective uh, solar power generation than if you are out in broad sunlight. So, you know, there needs to be something that says, hey, right now I'm getting eight volts or whatever, whatever power they are getting from the solar panel. The controller needs to know how much that is and it needs to control what goes into the battery and it needs to do it in a safe way. It also needs to do it in different ways depending on the chemistry of your battery. So again, if you have a traditional lead acid battery like most starter batteries, that is one type of battery chemistry. Then there's AGM or deep cycle batteries. I've run some of those as both starter batteries and as a dual battery, so a secondary battery to run my house battery or my auxiliary stuff off of in addition to my starter battery. And then there's the newer type that are also the most expensive type, which is the LifePo4. Um, these are basically like, these are basically the highest capacity. You can use them down the lowest amount compared to the other alternatives and, uh, and they're great options, but they're more expensive. So let's dive into a little bit of those battery chemistries. Again, I am not an electrician, so this is just the stuff that I have learned. But again, I'm just trying to shortcut you a little bit to save you some time and energy 
so that you know a little bit about solar and you're not as intimidated by it. So your traditional lead acid battery is probably the least efficient of these three battery types that I'm talking about. It's not really great for storing a ton of power. It's not really great for discharging a ton of power. It's basically intended to give a big jolt to your starter when you need to start the vehicle. And that's about it. It doesn't store a ton of capacity. It has a high cranking amps to, again, send that big jolt to your starter to turn the vehicle over. But that's about it. You're not going to be running stuff off of it for a long time. However, the starter battery is extremely important to your setup too. So when I get into uses here towards the end of this podcast slash video, um, I'll talk a little bit about using some sort of a solar panel to kind of keep your starter battery topped off so you don't have to worry about having a dead battery, let's say after being out in the wilderness for a couple days camping or overlanding, and you go to start your vehicle, you don't have to worry about a dead battery because the solar can keep that topped off. However, again, the point is not capacity. You're probably not going to be able to run a diesel heater or a refrigerator freezer off of that because it has too much need for energy that the starter battery just won't house. So moving on to AGM batteries. This is your next sort of option. This is what I went to. You can get AGM starter batteries that both have the capacity to start a vehicle, but also have a greater uh, draw rate. So you can basically draw down the capacity of that battery farther than a traditional lead acid battery. Typically with AGM batteries, you can take them down to about 50 to 60%. So let's say you have a 100 amp hour uh, AGM battery. You could use about 50 amp hours of that battery before you're going to be in trouble of hurting the battery. Um, this is important, and I'll tell you why here in a second when we talk about LifePo 4. It's just something to be aware of and some quick math to do in your head as far as capacity goes. Now, I will put a link in the description down below to uh, an article that kind of helps you calculate what your usage is based on the stuff you want to power off of it because everybody's usage is going to be a little bit different. So anyways, that article will be helpful for calculating both AGM and LifePo 4 battery usage. But I won't go too far into that because that article will be in the description down below. So now let's move on to LifePo 4 batteries. These have become my favorite. Over the last like three or four years, I've pretty much gone exclusively to either a traditional starter battery and just leaving it alone as a starter battery or an AGM deep cycle as my starter battery, just so that I've got that extra capacity if I need it, and then some sort of a LifePo4 uh, house battery. Now, LifePo4 batteries can be depleted about down to like 90, 95%. So again, comparing it to that 100 amp hour uh, AGM battery where you could use about half of it with a LifePo4 battery that's 100 amp hours, you can use about 90 to 95% of it. So you could take it way down to about 10% before you really have to worry about damaging the battery because of the chemistry of it, because of the composition of the LifePo4 battery. Again, though, you're going to pay significantly more for a LifePo4 battery than you would for an AGM and than you would for a traditional lead acid battery. However, prices have started to change a lot, and AGM batteries now are about half as expensive as they were when I bought my first one about four years ago. I bought a 100 amp hour about four years ago for what I thought at the time was a steal of a deal and was much cheaper than most of the other options for about 470 bucks. Nowadays, you can get one for about 200 to 230 bucks, somewhere in that range. Uh, I have this Golden Mate 100 amp hour that I turned into a portable power bank. I'll link to that video and to that uh, battery down below, but it's about 200 to 220 bucks for a really nice 100 amp hour LifePo4 battery. In addition to the batteries though, you also have to consider your solar panel makeups. So there's basically monocrystalline and polycrystalline. The difference between these two is just the composition of the silicone cells that they use to collect that photovoltaic power, AKA power from the sun. So the monocrystalline is a little bit cleaner style. It will collect more energy, a higher rate of energy, a higher percentage of the sun that is hitting that panel will be collected from a monocrystalline versus a polycrystalline. So when you're looking at them, there's also a cost difference. So if you have a lower budget and you just don't mind that you get a little bit less collection of power, you could go with a polycrystalline versus the monocrystalline. Um, and then last, there are a couple different types of controllers. There's the MPPT or multi-point uh, controller. That one is a little bit smarter than the old style, which I forget what it's called, but it's like PNW. There's something, uh, I'll put it up here on the screen. Um, that was the style that I had originally. I had a Renogy 100 watt panel hooked up to an old school controller and it worked great. I used it to keep my starter battery topped off. Eventually I upgraded my starter battery to an AGM battery and I was running a fridge off of it and using it as a starter battery. And with the solar, I would go out to my truck and every day it'd be at 100%. So it's just kind of a nice backup to have solar to keep something like that charged. But again, the controllers, there are a variety of different kinds. There are also things like the Red Arc, which is what I use, which is a really smart battery controller and does even more than that. It can, you know, 
handle accessories. You can plug stuff directly into it. You can plug your solar in. You can have power coming from your alternator. So you can get as crazy as you want. And I think that's what intimidates a lot of people. But the main thing to remember here is that the main thing you need is a solar panel, some sort of controller, and then a battery. If you're just gonna keep it as a separate system or you're just interested in charging your sort of starter battery or maybe an AGM starter battery and running stuff for a day or two at a time like a refrigerator or a diesel heater, you're probably gonna be fine with just an AGM starter battery and some simple solar hooked up somewhere on your vehicle like the roof or the hood or somewhere where you can get it where it will get enough sunlight to keep that stuff topped off and keep you going. At the same time, if you're keeping it that simple with just a starter battery that has a bigger uh, available capacity to use like an AGM starter battery. When you start your vehicle to go take off to go to your next campsite, that alternator will also charge it back up. So then you have the benefit of both the solar and the vehicle's alternator keeping that battery topped off all the time. So then that kind of brings us into the third part of this, which is uses, right? So just looking at my history, when I first had my first overlanding vehicle, which was an Xterra, I had, I bought that 100 watt uh, Renogy panel with the old school controller. And I literally put that thing on the hood of my vehicle. I hooked those cables up to the controller and then you have an output from the controller, positive and negative, that goes to the battery, positive and negative terminals, right? You attach it to your battery and then the controller does all the heavy lifting and, uh, and basically just automates that whole system for you. So when you have that solar on your truck, it's just constantly sort of doing whatever it can to push juice through and keep your battery at the best possible level. So that is one of the uses, and that is kind of the first way that I used it, right? Is just simply as a, I, I was starting to have some parasitic loss from some of my auxiliary lights that I had on the truck and a winch and just all this stuff, and it was kind of slowly draining my battery. And so if I waited three or four days to drive the truck, I'd go outside and I'd have a dead battery. That happened once or twice. I had to buy a whole new battery. So I went ahead and I upgraded to an AGM starter battery. I had an Odyssey. It was great. I'll put a link to that in the description down below, the one that I used. But it was awesome. It was about 300 bucks, so it was more expensive than a traditional lead acid battery, but I got a lot more capacity out of it, and it was fantastic. It held juice a lot longer. It was able to run all my accessories more efficiently, and with the solar pumping into it, you could just, on those controllers, you can adjust lead acid versus AGM versus LiPo4 and set it for the right chemistry, and then it keeps that thing topped off for you. Once I put the solar on my truck on the hood, I was... I never had the dead battery issue again. It was amazing. It just keeps your truck topped off. So that is a use. Just using it to keep your starter battery or even a deep cycle starter battery constantly topped off so that you just don't have to worry about a dead battery. Um, another use is to use it for a dual battery setup. Now again, without going too deep into the weeds here because I'm not trying to bore you guys with this stuff, you could have a dedicated starter battery, right? So just your OEM setup that came with your vehicle. And then separate from that, you could have a separate battery. You could have say a 100 amp hour LifePo4 battery that you put somewhere in the back of your vehicle, for example, and you have your solar running into a controller that then runs into that battery works the same way. You don't have the benefit of an alternator, right? You don't, it's not hooked up to the alternator like your starter battery is, so you're only getting power from the solar. So you do have to watch your capacity and, and maintain that it stays full. So usually some sort of like uh, a controller that's smart enough or can display the power of the battery is helpful. But you could do a separate whole battery that you use to run your refrigerator, to run a diesel heater, to run auxiliary lighting, to you know charge things like your phone and things like that in the back of your vehicle. I built something like that for my Xterra. I basically built a box with a small uh, AGM. I actually started with an AGM battery, not a LifePo4 because it was cheaper, but an AGM battery in the back that I would use to charge my smartphone, that I would use to run music and stuff in the back of the truck, that I would use to run some lights that I had on the the hatch of my Xterra so that if I'm cooking or something back there, I had some lights and I didn't have to worry about killing the, the starter battery in my truck. So that's an option too. And with something that's built into your vehicle, like a dual battery setup, then you can hook up that solar just straight to that. And you can just have your, your regular old starter battery. The truck works just like normal. And then you have this separate battery that's charged off the sun. As long as you don't, again, deplete it to a point where you get it too low, you do have to monitor it a little bit more as with a separate setup like that. That is an option as well. Then another option is kind of what I have, which is the Red Arc system, which actually connects your starter battery and your uh, house battery. So it can see everything. It can pull power from the alternator. It can pull power from solar. It can s deal with different types of chemistry batteries. So a lot of the times, some of these controllers can't deal with, if you're trying to charge multiple things and you have one that's a traditional lead acid and one that's a LiPo4, some controllers can't handle that. The Red Arc can, and a lot of the other more expensive, smarter systems can do that as well. 
But that's where you're going to want to get into. You're getting deeper into the weeds. You're going to want to go to like some forums. You're going to want to ask some questions. You're going to want to find some articles about it. But there are a lot of uh, resources out there if you're really getting into like deep diving into dual battery setups. So keeping it high level here for the solar conversation, I'm going to move on to kind of my final option, which is just simply using solar to recharge something like a portable power bank. So like this battery bank here has a solar input on it. So basically you could just plug your solar, it can either be mounted to your vehicle or you could have like a, a portable panel type that you can fold out when you wanna collect power from the sun and you can just plug it straight into a power bank. The nice thing about that is you can bypass the controller. So all of these power banks have their own controllers basically built into them. So all you have to do is plug in some sort of a solar panel, again, whether it's mounted to your vehicle or a fold out style that you can set on the ground or put on your hood or put it wherever you need to to get it in the sun. Um, you could just plug that straight into a power bank like that and charge it. So the nice thing about that is, again, it's just simpler, right? If you just wanna have a folding sort of solar panel that you take with you and a power bank, that's a great option as well. And especially if you're gonna be out for longer periods of time, it's nice to have that flexibility to be able to recharge it in that sort of way. So that'll kind of do it for the uh, uses for solar, but you do not have to go super in depth. You do not have to spend millions of dollars and do a full dual battery setup with inverters and all this stuff. If you really just wanna keep it simple, get something like, you know, this all power uh, budget, My this is like 300 bucks, 350 bucks, somewhere in that ballpark. And I think it's like 600 watt hours. So you get a ton of capacity in that. You can plug a solar panel in it. You can buy portable folding solar panels. I'll put a couple links to some down below for 150, 200 bucks. So for maybe 500 bucks total, you can have a completely portable, completely independent setup that you can move from one vehicle to the next, use it at a soccer game, take it camping with you, use it in your backyard to run some speakers or something when the kids are playing outside. You could use it for a million different things, but solar should not be intimidating. There's so many cool ways to use it and it's very cost effective, especially nowadays that prices have dropped. So that will do it for kind of solar basics. And I know I threw a ton at you there. So of course, if you have any questions or anything, post up in the comments down below. Again, these are basics, right? I'm not an electrician. If I said anything wrong, apologies, post up in the comments down below, but I'm pretty sure all that stuff was pretty basic and, and pretty right. Of course, as always, I will put links in the description down below to all the sort of stuff that I mentioned in this video, anything that I've used that is pretty decent uh, from like a quality standpoint. So if you're looking for some suggestions around solar panels, I'll put that down there. I've had four or five of them. This is a solar panel right here that's getting ready to go on my rooftop temp. It's a 200 watt flexible solar panel. I'll put a link to that. So there are just a ton of different options out there, but most of them, I've, I've used a lot of the cheaper ones and they've been fine. Solar is a pretty straightforward, pretty old tech at this point. Like they've been making it for a long time. So most of the stuff lasts forever. Renogy stuff has been really good to me. Um, so again, I'll put links to all that stuff in the description down below. There will also be links to all my other social channels. So I'd love to have you as a subscriber. I'd love to chat with you in other places. So Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, wherever you want to hang out, come check out those links down below. Also in the description down below will be a link to my website where I've got funny overlanding camping themed patches and stickers. So Velcro backed patches, really nice quality stickers. If you're looking for something like that to throw on your fridge or your windows or your rooftop tent or whatever, uh, check those out as well. And then last but not least, there if you're on YouTube, there is a join button down below here. This is a new thing. Uh, it's basically just a way to support the channel. So no pressure whatsoever, but if you wanna support the channel, uh, there is that join button right down below. If you click on that, you get some access, early access to the videos, you get some other exclusive perks. So that's kind of cool. There's also the Patreon group down below and we have a 24 seven Discord where we all kind of chat and message with each other. And that's a ton of fun. We're also taking a couple trips a year. So looking forward to our first one of those. And those are gonna be a ton of fun as well. And then there's also the Newbie Overlanders group, which is a great place to come and learn, ask questions, totally free to join. It's on Facebook. So if you're in, so if you're on Facebook and you're looking for a place to ask questions, that may be a good place to start. But again, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. I hope that was helpful and we'll see you next week.